Good afternoon. Today we will be talking about OSU integration. I am Tim Coons. I am a Georgia Tech student right now. I am getting my major in Masters of Science in Prosthetics and Orthotics. And I'm actually a University of Idaho graduate who graduated with a degree in Biological Systems Engineering uh, in 2011. So today's talk will be focusing around OSU integration. It should be about five to ten minutes, so it shouldn't be too long. And more specifically with OSEO integration, we'll be more looking at the prosthetic component of OSEO integration and the potential future that could be there. So today we'll be going over a couple things, the very basics of what OSEO integration is, the history of OSEO integration, some of the current models that we're testing here at Georgia Tech, and some of the future uh, implications of OSU integration with prosthetics and then we'll be closing out with closing remarks. So what is OSU integration? OSU integration it actually derives from two words in the Greek language the first being ostion which is for bone and integrare which is for making whole. So combined together, it's making the bone whole with something else. When you look at that definition, you come up with the integration of non-biological materials into bone. Some of the common examples we think of today are replacement hips. And you can see here on the left side of the picture where the uh, replacement hip actually is and it's integrated into the bone. You can see through the pylon or abutment that goes directly into the femur how it integrates into the bone. Another common example that we can associate with osseointegration today is external fixation. And here's a very crude example of external fixation where they have a lot of pins that are going directly through the skin into the bone and holding the bone into the correct position to allow healing. This is a very temporary option. As you can imagine, you couldn't really weight bear on this, and it would be very painful to have all these pins sticking through your skin. And another common example are dental implants, where a filling could be considered osseointegration since your teeth are bones, or whole tooth replacement could be considered osseointegration as well, where you have the implant that goes down into the actual maxilla or the mandible, respectively, and from there you attach on implants or essentially prosthetic teeth. So you can tell from all these examples that osseointegration is actually very widely used in today. A lot of people think of osseointegration as something that's kind of futuristic, that is not very viable, but it's actually been something that's been around for quite some time already these years. So the history of osseointegration, it actually began all the way back in 1950. And the father of osseointegration was regarded as Per Ingvar Brunemark. And he actually discovered osseointegration in 1952. And the way he did this is he was studying the blood flow in rabbit bone and he had a titanium implant vessel that he implanted into the bone and when his experiment came to a conclusion, he needed to take the implant back out. Well, he went to go do that, and he found that, well, it was stuck in there, and it had actually osseointegrated into the bone, and thus he couldn't get it out. So he found osseointegration and decided that this could be a very viable medical tool or one of the medical tools in your toolbox that you could use for a lot of different things. So in 1965, he created what would be the first dental implant. And this was actually used on the palate of a patient, the bone that's on the upper part of your mouth. And the idea was that he wanted to fill in this empty space in between because the patient that he was working on had an underdeveloped palate. So what he was doing was inserting a titanium piece in between the two undeveloped pieces of the palate and thus closing it off and fixing the problem of having the undeveloped um, palette. In the 1970s, he actually entered into a partnership with Bofors and, and began mass producing dental implants for distribution around the world. Uh, in, from the 1950s to the 1980s, the medical community basically had a very hard time coming to terms with osseointegration being used for other stuff besides dental implants. 
a lot of doctors saw it as a very high risk surgery where you're implanting something that shouldn't be there and could and the complications that could result were very serious so up until about 1980 osseo integration besides dental implants weren't really used that much Beginning in the 1980s, we saw actual osseointegration used for fixation. And by fixation, I mean where the bone is broken and you fixate it together by screws or plates and then you'd hold the bones together, the bones would heal together, and then you'd have the option of either removing the implant or actually keeping it in there. And you, it was primarily used for internal fixation where all the screws and the plates were contained within the body so it wasn't actually going through the skin barrier. There were some rare cases where external fixation was used but it was very uncommon and it had high rates of infection. In 1995 was when we saw the first usage of osseointegration in prosthetics and the picture down below that is one of the first examples of how we use osseointegration with prosthetics. What it was, was they had an abutment made of hydroxyapatite and titanium that went into the first metacarpal, that's the bone attaching to the thumb, and it actually protruded out of the skin, and you can see where it protrudes out there on the thumb, or what where, or where it would have been the thumb, and from there you could actually attach a prosthesis onto it. Up until that point, well, still up until about a couple years ago, infection was still posing an extremely great threat. By having osseointegration with prosthetics, where you go through the skin, the skin barrier was compromised, and this was a very big thing to overcome. With the skin barrier being compromised, infection rates were extremely high, and as of 2010, infection rates were at approximately 18% from complications. And to achieve FDA approval, infection has to be 0.01% or lower. This is for prosthetic or implant components relating to non, um, where you use them for instances where the person is not an immediate threat of death. Some of the other problems that they've uh, been coming up with with osseointegration is over time the implant actually loosens in the bone and some of the implants that they've been using, you can actually grab them and wobble them around in the bone for lack of a better term. It's basically loose in there and feels extremely uncomfortable and painful, as you can imagine something moving around in your bone. So some of the current models. Why exactly is osseointegration with prosthetics important? Well, it basically gets rid of the entire premise of having to design a socket and a socket is the hardest part to design for prosthetics. You can look at some of the pictures in below and start really appreciating how hard it really is. All those holes or fenestrations as we call them in the business are put in specific locations to allow movement of the muscles and all these sockets have to be custom designed for each individual patient. There really is no one fits all type situation if you want the socket to be as comfortable as possible. There was news, or there's been uh, reports today actually in CNN of a prosthesis used for transrail amputations. That's for the forearm of the, or the, that's where you have an amputation of the forearm. And it is a cost effective design costing about $300, but it's a used for everyone type of situation. And unfortunately, a lot of amputations are not as simple as we'd like them to be. If they were, uh, we wouldn't really have this problem with sockets. A lot of the skin issues that can occur are scarring. A lot of people imagine that when somebody has an amputation, it is a relatively clean looking residual limb, and that's not always the case. You have a lot of scarring that it can occur from both the surgery or the way the amputation happened with explosions, infection, a lot of times it can happen from fire, and a lot of scarring occurs in the area. And with scarring comes invagination. And invagination is basically the overgrowth of skin. So you end up with these huge clumps of skin around that can actually be very sensitive. There's also the issue of having irregular shaped residual limbs where the bone could have been broken while during the amputation or the cause of the amputation, causing the residual limb to be tilted to the side or not be completely straight. 
There's also the issue of volumetric changes. A lot of people don't realize, but throughout the day, the volume of your residual limb or where you had your amputation actually changes quite a bit throughout the day. A lot of people have to put on about 10 to 15 socks throughout the day as their residual limb shrinks down in size. So having osseointegration where you don't have to worry about the socket, where it actually attaches directly on to the rest of the prosthesis would solve a lot of these socket issues. Previous models have used hydroxyapatite, and we originally thought that hydroxyapatite was really good at promoting bone growth, but for some reason, whenever we would implant it into the bone, we just couldn't get the bone growth that we needed. So we have now started using titanium-based implants. And titanium is really good because it's biologically inert, and the tissue actually readily integrates into the implant. Shape also plays a very important role, as we're slowly finding out, with osseointegration, with how well it integrates as well or into the bone as well as how well it integrates into the skin, which is a very important thing to take into consideration when using osseointegration with prosthetics. So here's a basic design of what we think of when we have a osseointegrated prosthesis. So you have the bone and you have the fixture, which is basically the os or the abutment or the osseointegrated implant, which screws in to the bone, for lack of a better term, goes through all the soft tissue and exits out through the skin interface, and at the end of the abutment is where we attach the rest of the prosthesis onto. Here is a picture of a trans or somebody with a transfemoral amputation. This is through the thigh with an osseointegrated implant, and you can see how it actually protrudes through the skin, and you can immediately tell where the infection issues would immediately pop up, right where the implant goes through the skin. So some of the current models we're using here at the Georgia Institute of Technology is we're actually using a porous titanium coating. And one of the important factors that we're looking at is the extrusion rate. And the extrusion rate is actually a very interesting phenomenon. When somebody has an implant put placed underneath the skin, what happens is it is actually extruded out through the skin. And if you left it there long enough, it would actually push its way through the skin. A lot of times, what happens with if somebody is shot in the leg or the arm with a bullet and it's very hard to get out, what they actually do is they leave the round in there and about a year to two years later, the round will actually work its way out through the skin and basically just pop out of the arm. So what we're doing is we're looking at a rat skin model, and we've been looking at porous titanium coatings and implanting these underneath the skin of the rat and seeing how long it really takes for the different uh, pore, si pore sizes of the porous titanium to actually become extruded out through the skin. We, I can't really go into details as to how big these pores are, but we found an optimal size to these pores that allows maximal osseointegration as well as skin integration, which was the primary focus of this research. Uh, we're also looking at the integration into the bones, and the way we do this is through CAT models. We actually implant the, or the abutments into CATs, and we have the CATs walk around and we go through a loading schedule, and through this loading schedule of the prosthesis, we actually see integration of the bones into the prosthesis as well. One other thing that we're also looking, about, looking at is the osseofeedback component. Osseofeedback is the sense of, your, of the abutment being touched. Since it is directly attached to the bone, the idea is that if I was to tap the end of the abutment or the end of the prosthesis, you'd actually be able to feel that within your bone and realize when your foot is kicking into something or you're walk or you're step down it makes it a lot easier to ambulate right now with current uh, prosthetic te technologies with the socket it has all those forces have to travel through a lot of soft tissue and a lot of the times it's very hard to tell where exactly your prosthesis is in space and whether or not you're kicking stuff or running into stuff one common thing that you find a lot of the times is people who have prostheses 
a lot of times they drop something on their foot and they have no idea it happened. They don't even know that they've broken their prosthesis until they go to take a couple more steps and they all of a sudden fall down. So having osteofeedback could be a very advantageous feature in terms of keeping patients safe. Some of the future models that we are currently looking at is uh, further integration into the bone. With more integration into the bone, it will allow for the abutment to not become loose over time and it will actually hold it in place much better. Uh, further integration into the skin will also help reduce the amount of, will reduce the rate of infection, which is obviously a very big issue. Uh, so one of the models that we're currently looking at at Georgia Tech here is with an osseo-ingrated abutment to also have tendon control of the terminal device. What this amounts to is we'll be attaching to the tendons that would normally be controlling the your hand or your foot. So we'd attach to those tendons and have a cable, for lack of a better term, that would come through the skin, attach to the prosthesis and actually be able to control what it does. So it would be using the same muscles and tendons that were there previously to actually control the terminal device. So if you were to think of you want to lift your foot up, all you'd have to do is think of that and your prosthetic foot would actually lift up. So a very novel technique that we're coming up with. So in closing, osseointegration, a lot of people haven't really realized how long we've already been using this in the medical field. Um, prosthesis use is, all, even though you know we've been using osseointegration for a while, we're still in the testing stages and it'll still require quite a bit of time before we'll be able to use it as a marketable technology. However, this will be coming in the near future. Uh, in closing, if you have any questions at all, you can go ahead and email me. My email is listed on this slide. It's tkunz6 at gatech.edu. Uh, if you have any questions about the master's program that I'm studying under right now for prosthetics and orthotics, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll try and answer them as best as you can. If you have any interest in the prosthetics and orthotics field, go ahead and email me and I'll be glad to answer any questions that I can.